Hello and welcome to film 2251, The Art of Adaptation. My name is Mohsen Nasrin and today's lecture is about the notion of dialogism in that the movie is in dialogue with the text that it is based on. I'm focusing on the case of Woody Allen as our case study for this week. But before that, I want to talk a bit about theoretical themes in relation with the notion of dialogism in cinema. So far in this course, we talked about issues such as fidelity or specific interpretation. Like we discussed that this is Roman Polanski's Macbeth, and this is um, Kurosawa's Macbeth. They are different. They are doing different things uh, with the original work. Sometimes, however, a filmmaker does not provide us with a specific interpretation of the text. Instead, he presents multiple voices. By that, he's inviting us to be active. It's like a question and answer, different interpretation. All of them are present in the movie. And he's asking us to walk with the director within a universe with multiple competitive voices. Kid makes love to the old liquor stick, then. Hey, shut up! Oh, I'm sorry. Let me start again. He was waiting for the obligato. <laughs> Dialogism is a term coined by a Russian philosopher, Mikhail Bakhtin. Unlike previous linguistic theories of structuralism, such as that of Ferdinand de Saussure, who believed that linguistic units were closed systems, Bakhtin believes that literary works always are in dialogue with other literary works and other authors. And for that reason, there is no one interpretation of the original text. However, a text can always be judged in relationship with another text. Another Bakhtinian term that we can talk about here is the notion of heteroglossia. It is a complex idea, but in short, it refers to the existence of conflicting discourses within any linguistic unit. For example, he suggests that in the novels of Fyodor Dostoevsky, there are multi-language and voices present in the novel. Heteroglossia does not straightforwardly reveal the film's final judgment, the only interpretation. Instead, it is asking the audience to remain active within the multiple layers of voices present. In previous weeks, we talked about the notion of intertextuality, specifically in relationship with uh, French New Wave. And it's undeniable that Woody Allen was influenced by European cinema, specifically the new wave in France. However, referentiality in Woody Allen films is different than simply the notion of intertextuality. I can compare Woody Allen films in terms of the literary works that it refers to as a form of variation. In music, we have a term known variation, and it means material is repeated in altered forms. One melody, it is repeated in different forms. Woody Allen at least has four or five films that are related to Fyodor Dostoevsky's crime and punishment. Each one offers a different way of engaging with the moral philosophy of the novel. Uh, the main question of the novel is actually, is there such a thing as morality if we do not believe in God? Can we, can we rationalize uh, our crimes and not be guilty about them? Woody Allen sometimes offers multiple characters. Each one has a different word view. Like in Crime and Misdemeanor, there is the central story that is similar to Crime and Punishment, but also some other 19th century uh, theater works in by Scandinavian writers. But there is a philosopher and a filmmaker in the movie. Each one has a different view 
on the way the character rationalizes his actions. And more to the point, we can see the visual elements, the performances, the facial expressions of the actors. All these things are offering multiple voices with regards to uh, the issue at stake. So Woody Allen films are not adaptations of Crimes and Punishment. Instead, it's a variation on the moral questions of the novel, which is the ideological intoxications of the crime done by the individual. What happens when the eyes of God is not with us anymore? In this near the ending scene of Crime and Misdemeanor, where both characters are proven wrong, the character who is moral and the other character who is trying to rationalize his action. So we will experience multiple conclusions with regards to what is right and wrong by the end of the film. Oh, like me. I always get sad at these kind of events. You look very deep in thought. <clears throat> I was plotting the perfect murder. Yeah? Movie plot? Movie? Mm -hmm. Ben, uh, that's what Ben told me. He says you make films. Yeah, but not that kind. You know, a different kind. I have a great murder story. Yes? Great plot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, I've had too many to drink. I mean, forgive me, I... I know you want your privacy. No, it's okay. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing anything special. Except my murder story has a very strange twist. <clears throat> yeah. Let's say there's this man who was very successful. He has everything. Phony. Are you what? Am I a phony? What are you talking about? Are you a little high or something? No, I'm... You know, I think he hates me. Who hates you? Your annoying husband. He's, uh, he's, every time I'm with him, I, I get uh, I get tense, you know? It's just that he's angry, you know that. What? You know what? That, uh, what? At what? Are you yeah. kidding me? He's got these fantasies about changing the world. This is a man who thinks he can change the world. He makes yeah. these films, and in the end, they come to nothing. No. They're nothing. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Mike. He's got to grow up. I mean, this is the real world. This mm -hmm. is the big time. They don't... They don't pay off on high aspirations. You got to deliver, you know. I mean, I, and not to mention the fact that, I, I mean, I can't believe it. You're, you're still young. You're not getting the life that you deserve, you know. Lester, I met somebody. Oh, that. Oh, <laughs> that is music to my ears. Yeah. And after the awful deed is done, he he finds that he's plagued by deep-rooted guilt. Little sparks of his religious background which he'd rejected, was suddenly stirred up. He hears his father's voice. He imagines that God is watching his every move. And suddenly, it's not an empty universe at all, but a, a just and moral one, and he's violated it. Now he's panic-stricken. He's on the verge of a mental collapse, an inch away from confessing the whole thing to the police. And then one morning he awakens and the sun is shining and his family is around him. Mysteriously the, the crisis is lifted. He takes his family on a vacation to Europe and as the months pass he finds he's not punished. In fact he prospers. The killing gets attributed to another person, a drifter, who has a number of other murders to his credit, so, I mean, what the hell, one more doesn't even matter. Now he's scot-free. His life is completely back to normal. Back to his protected world of wealth and privilege. Yes, but can he ever really go back? Well, people carry sins around. Oh, maybe once in a while he has a bad moment, but it passes. And with time, it all fades. 
Yeah, but but so then you know, then his worst his worst beliefs are realized. Well, I said it was a chilling story, didn't I? <laughs> I don't know. It it be I think it'd be tough for somebody to live with that. You know, it's very few guys could could actually live you know to live with something like that on their conscience. Maybe people carry awful deeds around with them. I'm what, what, what do you expect them to do? Turn himself in? I mean, this is reality. In reality, we, we rationalize, we deny, or we, we couldn't go on living. Here's what I would do. I would have him turn himself in, because then you see, then your story assumes tragic proportions, because in the absence of a god or something, he is forced to assume that responsibility himself. Then you have, then you have tragedy. But that's fiction. That, that's movies. I mean, I mean, you see too many movies. I mean, I'm talking about reality. I mean, if you want a happy ending, you, you should go see a Hollywood movie. Come <laughs> on, darling. Let's think about going home, huh? Nice talking to you. Good luck to you. Miriam, we're going to make a wedding like this for Sharon. And I can't wait. She'll be radiant. You're looking very handsome tonight. And you look beautiful. Mm -hmm. So the notion of dialogism, intertextuality, and referentialities in the films of Woody Allen helps us to have an active, dynamic dialogue with the original text rather than having a single statement on it. You can see Woody Allen's obsession with the question of rationality and humans' morality in his reading of the works of Fyodor Dostoevsky. So we can see Bakhtinian polyphony in his cinematic engagements with the works of writers such as Dostoevsky. Were you acquainted with either of the victims? Peripherally, I knew Nola Rice. Hi. She was engaged for a time to the man who's now my brother-in-law. That's uh, uh, Tom Hewitt. That's correct. Uh, they broke up a year ago. More. Mm -hmm. When did you last see her? Oh God, I can't remember. Uh, at the Tate Modern, my wife and I ran into her. But that was a long time ago. Have you seen her since? Not that I recall. Have, um... Have you ever seen this? No. What is it? Are you aware that Nola Rice kept a diary? As you can see, you're all over it. Do you still claim that you haven't seen her except for more than a year ago at the Tate Modern? You can't blame me for trying to hide the fact that I had an affair with her. But you people have to protect me here. So Woody Allen films are a means for directors' interpersonal communication with other literary texts. The inclusion of philosophical questions would enhance the original works without damaging other aesthetic criteria for a cinematic work. Hence, the communicative power of Woody Allen films is based on counter evidences, a good deal of emotional obsessions with the text, and arguments based on imaginations. Woody Allen's way of handling philosophical questions and themes it's always based on what is available through a cinematic medium for him. Moreover, he's not didactic about his own philosophical vision. His view is always present among other competitive discourses, all unified through certain cinematic 
means such as the use of humor, the sound, visual compositions, and so forth. Kant would argue that in a truly moral world, there's absolutely no room for lying. Even the, the smallest lie destroys his precious categorical imperative. So Kant would say if a, if a killer came to your house looking to kill the man hiding upstairs and asked where he was, you'd be obliged to tell him. And his perfect world, you know, you, you couldn't lie. I can see the logic that if you open the door, even just a crack, you accept the world where lying is permitted. Uh -huh. Okay, then, then you'd say if the Nazis came to your house hiding Anne Frank and her family and asked if anyone was in the attic, you'd say, yeah, the Franks are upstairs. I doubt it. <laughs>